So the topic today I'm going to talk about is the social CRM. A little bit different to just CRM, which stands for Customer Relationship Management, and how this can be applied uh, alongside big data. Okay, so you can see that organizations have been collecting data for a long time, even before we had the internet and all of these smartphones. Organizations collected data about various things. Okay. There was, of course, no formal recognition of this data as an important intangible asset. People are collecting data, sometimes, you know, talking to people, talking to customers, talking to your, to your uh, suppliers. Uh, the data often was collected, but not in any formal way. So organizations, people collect data and create vast quantities of ad hoc data every day. Every time you speak to a customer, supplier, um, the tax office, whatever, you're collecting data. So for example, an organization learns something new and potentially valuable each time an employee picks up a phone and talks to a customer or supplier and a person or, uh, visits an organization's website. We are collecting information. But where does this data go? Where does it all go? It is saved into notepads and documents and laptops perhaps, or even maybe it is stored in a person's head. That's why a lot of the history of an organization is often in someone's head. And when that person leaves, all of that history is also gone with them. So traditional CRM had a number of different areas, okay? A CRM was where we tried to bring together within the organization in some sort of more formal way, all of this data that was collecting. Okay, so it is a solution to a major issue as it takes this data and turns it into useful, actionable insights that can transform an organization. So just a minute while I uh, get myself a laser pointer here. Okay, so you can see that all of these areas form your customer relationship. So the, the systems, often these are fairly sophisticated um, computer software systems, okay, that can track this information. Okay, there are CRM systems that run into millions of dollars that are used by very large organizations, but you can get a fairly sophisticated CRM system free of charge from the internet, okay, where you can get a, a CRM system that you can download. Okay, so that is a CRM system. It's a tool and a strategy for managing customers' interactions using technology to automate a business's processes. It consists of sales information, marketing information, customer service activities with the aim of finding and attracting new customers, nurturing them, and retaining them for future business. So that is a traditional CRM. So you can see it is all together, your sales, your marketing, your customer service, this all comes together in a traditional CRM. Okay, so this costs money, okay, to invest in CRM. A CRM helps an organization keep track of their customers' contact details, up to date, tracks every interaction they have with the business, manage their accounts. So businesses use CRM in meeting customers' expectations and aligning with the organization's mission and objectives in order to bring about a sustainable performance and effective customer relationships. So you can have a fairly simple CRM, it does not have to be a sophisticated one, where you every time a customer contacts you, phones you, faxes you, goes to your website, that information is captured. And then we organize it in some way. Many organizations have made huge investments in the CRM systems in order to collect, in, integrate, analyze data and use it to run their business activity. As I said, some of these go into millions of dollars, but you can even get fairly sophisticated CRM systems, open source from the internet. You can download, in fact, the CMA office has an open source CRM system to run its membership services called Civic CRM. Okay, so these are what you have, okay, in your invest, what you have to do in terms of investment. 
For example, in marketing activities as part of a traditional CRM system, leads, prospects, and even potential customers are exposed to a lot of marketing messages on a routine basis. So a lead, every time someone contacts your organization, goes to your website, that becomes a lead. I'll talk about leads a little bit more in detail. If they're interested, they become a prospect. What happens is we bombard them with all sorts of information, some of it that is not targeted to that person, simply because that we have captured their email address. So as there are, the messages are not targeted to individual needs, many recipients just ignore them as they see no personal value in them. In fact, I can say that even in a sense, the uh, webinars that the CMA runs is sort of like this. We send these webinar series to all our members and say, if you're interested, log on. But many of them are not interested and they just ignore it. We don't target it and say, these sorts of people we want, this sort of webinar, that we want that sort of webinar. No, we simply send it out. And that's unfortunately uh, the way it goes. Okay, so this is even worse, at least in the CMA, you are all members and therefore you all have interest in these areas. But in many organizations, this is sent out to anyone who email or other form of uh, information is captured. Emails are sent to general public or to random leads, prospects and customers, but an organization new product or service. And there is a significant fall off at each stage of an email recipient. So you can see from the <clears throat> huge amount of leads, only a few people become prospects. That means they're interested in your product. And from those prospects, only a few become actual customers. Now, one of our, uh, our chief um, operating officer overseas, our CFO actually, Dr. Chris D'Souza, he has a good story about it because he went to Dell Computers and he was looking at uh, buying a new laptop and he was clicking around and then he looked at the price and he said, no, that's not good. And he sort of was about to go away when he got a message um, chatbot saying, it looks like you're interested because the amount of time he spent on their website indicated that this person are not a random lead, but a prospect, someone who might buy. Okay, at that point, they sent and got him to make a telephone call free of charge. Okay, try to convert him to a customer. So you can see, that a prospect is a lead that has a potential of becoming a future customer. So you can see the fall off from becoming, sending this email out to a lead. A person must see the message. Many people don't even see the message. Some of it in fact goes to spam. <clears throat> Finding it has some information value to them. Even if they see it, they may say that's not of any relevance to us. And then finally, the last stage, it convinced them to finally buy the product. So that is the big fall off between each of the stages. Okay, so let's look at email campaigns, often extremely disappointing because individual leads, prospects and customers feel that they are bombarded with spam. Okay, in fact, some people get so annoyed with the amount of email that have been sent, they simply go down and say unsubscribe. A marketing campaign should be designed with an understanding of an individual recipient's habits and behavior and his her perceptions of product or service attributes so that the message received is perceived as valuable to the recipient. And in a way, that is why we feel <clears throat> that our emailing of the webinars to the CMA members is of some value for them, especially in this time when they're all locked at home and watching television, okay, so this is maybe of some help to them. Therefore, there's a need for personalization and customization of marketing that fits for each of the, each and every potential customer. So some sort of customization has to be done. Okay, so that is customer relationship management and reaching out to potential leads and prospects. Now let's see where big data comes in. Big data is a huge quantum leap from traditional CRM. Okay, in a traditional CRM, actually the custom, the, the lead contacts you in some way. Okay, makes some contact with you. Okay, but in big data, you're getting information even though the customer, potential customer, has no idea that you're getting this information. 
huge amounts of data that the public generates in multiple sectors and industries can be analyzed by individual wants and needs. Okay. So lots and lots of information, though you don't even realize it, are streaming from smartphones, computers, parking meters, buses, trains, supermarkets. Here are where some of the data is captured. Okay, we today know with facial recognition software, with your smartphones, there is no hiding. Okay, you can, anywhere you go, you can be tracked. <clears throat> so there's a lot of information that you're generating just by walking around. And can this information be useful? Especially if you are into social media areas like Facebook and so on. Okay, so as you know very well, that this big data was captured by an organization called Cambridge Analytica that analyzed it and then gave Donald Trump's presidential campaign the key words he was to use in all his speeches. Key words such as build a wall to keep the Mexicans out, stop Muslim immigration, all of these key words were found in the various Facebook uh, messages that were going out from his, from the, his potential uh, people who might vote for him. So he used that information. You can see targeted. <clears throat> so you can see search engine companies such as Google and uh, networking companies such as Facebook collect enormous amount of data on a daily basis, especially Facebook. Okay. Because we have all these likes and so on that are going on and that is a huge area for, of you collect the information. They then share this data to be analyzed as useful information for their customers, that is for targeted advertising, as well as their own revenue generation. Okay, so this is a little bit more because they're now seeing what people are talking about, what people are wanting, what people are searching for. And then of course, you know, if you search for anything on Google, the next time it comes up. Okay. <clears throat> So here are the big data components. They are known as the five V's of big data. The volume of analysis, volume, the velocity, the variety, veracity, and value. Let's look at these items. Okay, the fig, five area, the five V's of big data. So well, volume means processing massive, massive data from any data type gathered. The data, big data is particularly massive volume with large data sets. Such data cannot be analyzed for, uh, in its content using traditional database tools, management and processors. So there's a huge amount of data that has been collected, but they are not immediately analyzed. They're just collected. Now, when you want to analyze it, you have to give some keywords to see what are they talking. Then we can draw from the big data into a more specific analysis but initially it's simply collected. Velocity is the real-time data processing, specifically data collection and analysis. Velocity processes very large data in real-time processing. Variety is any type of data from which various channels include, such as structured and unstructured data from audio, video, image, <clears throat> and online behavior, and location data, for example, from Google, maps, web page, and so on. And this is all then brought together. Veracity is an interesting concept. It is the authenticity. The authenticity of data sources, for example, web log files, social media, enterprise content, transactions, data application, that they need a valid power of informing to ensure its authenticity and safety. Of course, many companies, including Facebook, have got into big trouble here because of all this fake news and all that are going on, okay, that they have to somehow try to clean up as much as possible, but it's seemingly an impossible task. And finally, value comes from analyzing and mining the data and statistical and other analytical um, calculations. Okay, so let us see how we bring these two together, okay? The um, CRM systems combined with big data brings a promise of big transformation that can affect the organization in developing CRM strategies. So now combining the two, okay. 
accurate and up-to-date profiling of target customers, often on a real-time basis, predicting customer reactions towards marketing messages on product and service offerings, and creating personalized messages that create emotional attachment to the product or service offering. So by listening to what they're saying, you target the message for an emotional attachment. And that's exactly what Donald Trump did in his presidential campaign. As I told you, he used keywords that people were using in talking to each other. He said that those are the emotional ones. Those are the hot buttons. I should press and I should talk and talk about those issues. These developments enable a company to maximize its value chain strategies. They provide an accurate assessment measures of how effective its campaign based on digital marketing has been. So you can actually target and find the effectiveness of their campaign. In the case of Donald Trump, he became president. Okay, so here's some areas of big data usage. The big ones are things like Netflix. It looks at what are the movies that you're selecting and it makes suggestions to you as to what they think you might like. Instead of using traditional methods of data gathering, they were able to find out what their customers wanted in terms of customer selections, mainstream cinema reviews, and video streaming. So if you look at Netflix, and many of you all have Netflix during this period of staying at home, okay, you will see that they not only suggest that you might like it, they also say, here are some videos like it based on the reviews and so on. They have all of that information available for you. It then makes measurable marketing decisions based on these analytics. So CRM coupled with big data features enable more aggression in the terms of push marketing strategies, such as notifications to smartphones to the potential target audiences. Okay, I mean, in the old days even, before big data, when some people had smartphones, the telephone company used to sell this information, the credit card company used to sell your activity on your credit card. And if you were then walking in the supermarket and they knew that you like, say, for example, McDonald's or Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, they used to send a message on your smartphone saying, hey, do you know that there is a McDonald's giving a special in your supermarket, in your shopping center? So there was, these are called push marketing because you're pushing the product towards the customer. So web apps, users who make comments such as liking a page or returns to the web app for our potential customers who are targeted for push notifications. Okay, so you have seen some of you have gone to Agoda, of course, not very popular these days with everyone in lockdown. But if you go to Agoda and you search for a hotel in Indonesia at this uh, in Jakarta, let us say, and you decide, no, you don't want to do it and you just go somewhere else, then you find things coming up for you with messages from Agoda saying, hey, do you know there are some great hotel things in Jakarta and so on. Okay, we see that you're thinking of going to Jakarta, these sorts of things. Technically, there are many third party for apps or web sites that can help business to set up push notifications to targeted users. Notifications can be set up to be auto-generated or manual whenever new content is available. These notifications can be directed at potential customer's convenience in the form of text messages, okay, link sharing, or smartphone notifications. So this is again push. You're notifying that person, this product is available at this time, at this price, hey, go and buy it. Okay. Customer profile can gain invaluable insight from big data analytics and create a competitive advantage. Some examples of customer profiling a service such include amazon.com, which developed a system of product recommendations based on their analysis of customers' previous purchase data. UPS, the package delivery company, which created an application to redesign the driver's daily routes to achieve fleet optimization by looking at the purchase behavior coupled with location of the individuals. Now, these are people who are looking at the order that you've made to then do their uh, either uh, good um, supply chain management or even suggesting another 
product for a customer. As Amazon was one of the first in this area. They knew what you have bought from them and therefore you could suggest some more products. A recent announcement of, uh, of the purchase of Fitbit watches by Google is generally considered data play as this organization has captured users activity rates over several years, which could be useful to potential advertisers of health and lifestyle products. So Google actually purchased Fitbit, okay, not to actually buy the company, which is not bad, but to buy the information that had been collected about everyone's habits on Fitbit. Okay, they of course got into a bit of trouble because um, I think in Iraq, the American army was using Fitbit to do their training and then the um, uh, people could find out where the army was because they could tap onto the location of the Fitbits that were around. So there were some privacy issues as well as security issues. Okay, so customer profiling is possible through big data analytics because the organizations have access to more accurate data and can discover the value of the hidden data connections and patterns. Some of these are not easy, easily visible to people. When they find certain patterns, they can then target the information. The CRM team generates customer knowledge profiling to enhance businesses, understand precisely the target audiences, personalize the message from each potential customer and tailor the message to fit individual customers' interest preferences. Now, of course, there are cases of companies getting into trouble in this area. A famous case that many of you may have heard <clears throat> is when Target, a department store in USA, sent a targeted mail, okay, by, by uh, regular post, sent a mail with a lot of vouchers for baby products to a person in a house. That person, a girl, her father opened the thing and told Google, told Target, why are you sending baby product vouchers to my daughter? Well, what the father didn't know and the daughter's doctor didn't know, but Target knew was that she was pregnant and she was looking at Target's websites for baby products. So Target found that that was something that she was searching for didn't realize it was a 16 year old girl and send the vouchers. So there could be some big issues in this sort of targeted marketing. That was a very famous case. CRM with big data analytics can also help develop comprehensive knowledge of customers product usage for service related decision making. Okay, so you can see how much you've used the product and then send out a message saying, it's time for your car service, it's time that you do this doctor's appointment, whatever, you can do targeted service related decision making. Okay, so now let's see what are social networks. Big data scientists recognize that the web today is a social network, having many collaboration platforms like wikis, blogs, social media, all aiming to facilitate creativity, collaboration, and sharing amongst users of tasks, other than just emailing and retrieving information. The success of social networking services can be seen in their dominance in society today, with Facebook having a massive 2.41 billion active users monthly. LinkedIn, the career-oriented social networking service that many of you are on, has 600 million users, about half of them being monthly active users. Okay. So essentially, <clears throat> these are networks that are empowering their customers to make global conversations. Okay, they can easily express their views and opinions. Now, very old days, hundreds, 200 years ago, this was the village square. People from all over the village came to the middle of the village and then they gossiped and talked about various people and all of that face to face. But now they can do the same gossiping true and untrue news and same sort of information sharing, but this time online. And they have massive platforms to do this. <clears throat> so films, restaurants, hotel and tradesman review sites are plenty. And even doctors and university lecturers are being reviewed in these ad hoc social rating networks. I have had my myself rated, luckily I got reasonably good ratings on a university lecturer's website that is created by I don't know whom. Okay, so there are many, many things. Rotten Tomatoes, Zomato, 
TripAdvisor Air Task are well known review sites. Okay, so I know that you young people out there, you all don't buy anything until you see a review. Okay, how is this review? Uh, it's good, I go for it. How is this movie? Is it good or not? Go for it. Okay, so Rotten Tomatoes is on movie sites, Zomato is on restaurants, TripAdvisor is obviously, and Air Task on tradesmen and so on. So these are typical review sites. Okay, there are review sites of doctors, engineers, all sorts of people. <clears throat> So organizations may utilize and increase the amount of big data found in people's conversations for the company's benefit. But social networks can also hurt a company as they allow customers to express complaints and negative opinions. You have no control over this. Someone doesn't like you, immediately bad review goes out. <clears throat> as such companies are realizing that they cannot manage their customers' relationship by only using traditional in-house CRM systems even if they're covered with big data. So big data in-house alone is not enough. The social network is outside the company's control. This is because with external social networks, a company has very little control over a medium that can be used to communicate a potential agenda to the public. And this agenda may be also from your competitors, not only people that has got a bad service from you. Negative views about a company products and services based not only by disgruntled customers and employees, but also by competitors. So how can you control this? There are competitors who set up private website that you don't know is a competitor, who are then sending out all these negative reviews about your product or service. So we have to somehow tame this wild child. Adopting social networks in the company CRM is known as social CRM. <clears throat> Developing one of these has become a must strategy for any organization today to understand their customers better. You really need to someone to focus and look carefully, entire, entire team in fact, to focus and look at what's happening out there in the social media. Okay, so you really have to look at all this. It's an advocacy area. Social CRM has impact towards multi-channel uh, multi-channel relationships in all types of organizations, both in the public and private sectors. Okay. Today, I don't know if anyone actually goes anywhere without looking at a review, especially if you're at a certain younger generation, perhaps under 40s. Uh, playing a significant role in the management of relationships, social CRM stimulates fundamental changes in a company's strategies based on an individual customer's behavior clean from conversations in the social network combined with company CRM systems. Okay, so they can look at all these conversations, are they positive, negative, and they try to analyze it and make use of it or defend against it. So taming the CRM is done via social engagement. Okay, so the social CRM, a tool allows businesses to better engage their prospects and customers by listening to sentiments about their product and service. And if there's a negative sentiment, immediately contacting, find out what it is and sorting the problem out. Social customer service, rather than companies delivering only outbound integrated marketing communications, such as media advertising, analyzing inbound individual customer queries, better to allow for meaningful points of engagement for brand advocacy. So look at anything coming in for you to advocate, not only things going out through media advertising. Personalized marketing strategies, the ability to create custom content is now increasingly dependent on access to reliable, qualitative social network user data to facilitate precise and individualized audience segmentation. Okay, so again, it's similar to earlier where we personalize the message, but this time it is after getting the social information into your company. Okay, so here are some examples of these sorts of social CRM strategies. YouTube uses the recommender system to keep the user switching to content within YouTube without going to another streaming service. This is jokingly called the YouTube hole, the black hole of YouTube, because you start clicking on one particular video, maybe talks about, you know, um, meditation or something. And then you see a thing on the side saying how the Beatles pop group band did meditation. 
and then you click on that and watch something completely different about a pop group. And then it, on the side it says, uh, you know, this pop group sang a song about uh, peace in the Middle East or whatever, and you click on that and you find someone talking about peace. You can go to all sorts of areas, but still be within YouTube. This is called the YouTube hole. I have got sometimes into the YouTube hole. Okay, I went to watch one thing and I ended up three years later by watching videos that were totally unconnected, but somehow YouTube managed to find the links. So these are the recommended systems that you find on the side of YouTube. Okay, also an individual's Google search can result in a viewing suggestion on YouTube because they are connected. You do something on Google, something pops up in YouTube or vice versa. Okay, and today the big one is your things like Google Home. Okay, which is a little device in your house that you can say, okay, Google, ask some question about it. And then it's supposed to respond to that question. But the fact is, we all know that Google is collecting every single conversation in your house, waiting for you to say, okay, Google, but it's also collecting and analyzing your conversation. Amazon does the same with their, I think, uh, Alexis, okay? They have admitted that they have, in fact, listened to conversations that indicate that there was some sort of domestic violence happening in the house. They don't use it for, or tell the police about it, but they are collecting information about you. They are saying a better marketing to you. Retailers use customers' past searches, purchase and social media engagements to provide very targeted messaging to customers. An airline ticket purchase on a certain destination leads to various suggestions at that location for accommodation, transfer, food, and tourist activities. So you bring together your website for your uh, airline ticket, the website for Agoda, and your phone. You have a very powerful tool because even if you didn't go to that particular airline, say I went and did a search on Singapore Airlines and I decided to fly with Garuda, then if Singapore and my phone company are connected, Singapore knows that you didn't fly with them, but you went to the destination that you did the search. Okay, then they will know that you are a serious search customer and they might target the message either through pricing or whatever to you. Okay, so targeted. And this often happens when you return to a website. As you well know, when you return, when you search for something in Agoda, you look at the price, you go and search other ones and you come back to Agoda because their price is the best, you find the Agoda price has gone up. Okay, these are all done through social CRM searches. Okay, now of course the big one is the privacy issues. I've already talked to you about the issues with that target example of the girl who was pregnant being sending vouchers and everyone got to get it to know. Human beings value their privacy and the protection of their personal sphere of life. They value some control over who knows what about them. Okay. They certainly do not want their personal information to be accessible to just about anyone at any time. Recent advances in information technology, along with big data antics and social CRM, have threatened this privacy, reducing the amount of control over the personal data and opening up the possibility of a range of negative consequences as a result of access to personal data. Now, the Australian government, when it asked us to download the COVID-19 app for making sure that we are not near someone else, has promised us that that app will not be used for any other purpose. For example, they will not use that app to show that I was uh, near someone and uh, robbing a house or something. Okay, they promised that it will be not used in court cases or anything like that. That's the promise. Okay, but they have admitted that some of this information may go overseas to be stored. And who knows what happens there. So there are big privacy issues with all this. Unlike traditional CRM systems, much of this information is collected without the knowledge of the individual. We have no knowledge that they're collecting this information. Okay. Everyone is looking at us, but we have no idea. For business firms, personal data about customers, approaching customers is of a key interest. At the same time, the meaning and value of privacy remains the subject of considerable privacy. The combination of increased power of new technology and the declining clarity and agreements on privacy give problems to concerns about law, policy, and ethics. Now, of course, the European Union has put out a case for even organizations like CMA 
that if we accidentally release an email or any private information of one of our members who happens to be residing in Europe, then each person's email that we accidentally release is subject to a possible fine of 10,000 euro. Okay, so there are some regulations, but it's not enough. So what are the management accounting implications? Management accountants need to be very aware of the value creation potential of marrying traditional CRM with big data analytics. An example would be in preparing the annual budget for a hotel chain. Key inputs into the forecast would be occupancy rates and room rates. Although big data, through big data, sorry, the management accountant can use readily available data on customer views of their hotel you can look at the review sites, such as Agoda and Booking.com, and room rates of competitive hotels, again, using these same sites. So we can get the budget. Of course, today, with all the businesses in lockdown, a lot of the leisure industries, all of the airline industries, it's chaotic. Even making forecasts of what's going to happen when they all open up is a very big question mark. In fact, so much so that the Australian government has now told a listed company that they no longer have to give quarterly uh, uh, sales and profit forecast because they can't be held liable if it doesn't come right. Okay, earlier, if they get the number wrong by a certain margin, they could be liable in court. Now it, they've said they waived that regulation until things settle down. Okay, so to conclude, Big Data provides organization management accountants with a new rich source of information to be mined for competitive advantage. It is important that we learn about the possibilities available to us through these technology breakthroughs. Hopefully this presentation started you on your big data and CRM journey once the lockdowns finish. Okay, thank you very much for that. <laughs>